believe, you know, that this is going on. And, and because they don't have to um, pay for the same kinds of insurance and licenses that real limousines and the, the taxi cab industry itself have to pay, they're basically undercutting us. So uh, for a while, that didn't really bother me because I was still able to go out there and hustle and, and, and make my money and everything. But quite recently, it was pretty well publicized that Uber slashed its prices again. And now, <clears throat> I used to listen to a lot of cab drivers complaining about their incomes dipping. And you know, I, I was always able to just go out there and, and keep my income the same. But now, I'm starting to see uh, my income dip and um, so that's where it's at. And uh, you know, there, there's been some publicity just today in the newspapers about uh, the owner of DeSoto Cab talking about how uh, his business is so affected that he's thinking about converting his taxi fleet into a charter party license, like a, a livery fleet, and just run them as these app platforms. So that's, that's kind of scary because you know, these companies, they do um, surge prices based on demand. So if they think a lot of people want their car service, they're going to jack up the prices two to three times uh, on the consumer. But one, one thing that, um, that the consumer has is that they always know that there's a regulated taxi service there. So if they don't want to pay two or three times the price, they know they can always get a cab and get a a regulated meter rate that they know they're going to pay the same price. But I think what Uber is doing right now is I think they're really going for the chokehold. And, and they're trying to bleed the cab business. They're trying to choke it out. They're going for the 10 count. And companies like DeSoto or Yellow or whatever, they're hoping that that's going to put an end to the cab business. And I think that's pretty dangerous because if, if the only car services available are these TNCs, and they don't have regulated rates and they can jack the prices up when they want to and keep them low when they want to, then I think um, the only thing that's really balancing it out right now is the tax industry. So that, that's something that concerns me. Thank you. Um, I'd like to ask Mark, if you could give us a little background on that. What actually is a tax? in San Francisco. How can you tell it's a taxi? Well, uh, a tax, first of all, I think one important distinction is uh, that, uh, that taxis are regulated by the city of San Francisco. The uh, limousine industry, which um, comes under the heading of charter party carrier, is regulated uh, by the state by the state of California, by the California Public Utilities Commission, or CPUC. And um, this is where uh, a huge amount of the uh, disparity in the treatment and in the regulations um, uh, comes in. But uh, taxi cabs are uh, under the, right now, under the, uh, the SFMTA. Previously, it was the Taxi Commission. And uh, the regulation, uh, that's in place, that has been in place for taxi cabs, uh, not only in San Francisco, not only in California, not only in the United States, but uh, going back to England, uh, to perhaps the 16th or 17th century, uh, before there was actually a taxi cab, obviously, but there were hackney carriages and, and so forth. Uh, this is there to protect the public. Uh, so uh, you have uh, licensing requirements. Um, every driver uh, has, to, has to go to a class, take a week of classes, uh, go through uh, an intensive background check um, with uh, fingerprinting and all that. Um, the vehicles themselves are regularly inspected. The companies themselves need licenses. Uh, dispatch services need licenses. All of this is, is uh, for, the, it's for the protection of both the public and the driver. And um, what we have on the other side is a very lenient, very lax regulation. Uh, the drivers themselves don't have any permits uh, whatsoever uh, in these TNCs. 
much of the rest of it is self-regulation, where the companies themselves are responsible for inspecting vehicles as opposed to taxis, which are inspected by government authorities. And uh, as lax as the regulation is, the enforcement of that regulation is almost non-existent. So uh, this, you know, this is is a scenario. This is the uh, the playing field on which taxis are being asked to compete. Is that? Thank you. And if you could then give us your five minutes on what your thoughts are on how this is affecting the industry. Well, uh, let me let me just uh, say. Um, maybe try to dispel a few, few myths about uh, these services. Uh, first of all, I, I think that I want to thank John for that, that excellent video. Uh, it touched upon the fact that um, although uh, these companies call themselves rideshare and the media has picked up on it and now anywhere you look you'll see uh, uh, the term rideshare being used, they are not rideshares. Uh, they, when they went uh, back even a further step, the, the CPUC, before it, it uh, actually gave these companies their approval, uh, they issued cease and desist orders against them. Said you can't operate, you're breaking the law. Uh, and then uh, through some backdoor dealings, uh, they suddenly decided to pull back on the cease and desist to start a rulemaking proceeding uh, with the end being to legitimize them in some way. And um, in that rulemaking proceeding, these companies came in and said, hey, um, you can't regulate us at all. You have no authority over us. We're rideshare. And sure enough, there is in the California law, if you're a legitimate rideshare, can't be regulated. Rideshare is if somebody is uh, taking someone else, not for profit, not to make money, somebody going in the same direction, a work-related uh, trip or whatever, and that's a ride share. And the CPUC, uh, although we uh, strongly disagree with their ultimate conclusion that these companies are illegal and should be uh, approved, they said in no uncertain terms, this is not ride share. You're not ride share. And so they just go on calling themselves ride share, press picks it up, up on it, and now everybody, except for a few smart reporters, um, you'll, you'll notice do not use the term ride share, but it's ubiquitous, right? So that's one myth. They're not ride share. Second myth, and you know, we're here to talk about technology. They're not innovative. They're, they're not the ones who have brought this technology uh, into the industry and into the public. Taxis were there first. Uh, back in 2008, uh, Luxor Cab uh, started using a, a taxi app called Taxi Magic, which is very similar to the apps that Uber and Lyft and these other companies use, before any of those companies ever existed. Uh, in 2009, I have to say that uh, I'm very proud of this, uh, Green Cab, um, our little Green Cab company, uh, was the first company to use an app called, uh, at that time called Cabulous, now called Flywheel, which is practically everywhere in the taxi industry. Most of the cabs in the city use it. Um, we were the first company to adopt it in 2009, also before any of these other companies existed. So um, their claim to be innovative uh, is also hogwash. The, the technology was there. Uh, the technology was in use. They simply had tons and tons of money to publicize themselves. They had this novelty of using people's private cars. And that's, you know, I mean, that's the big Achilles heel of this whole thing. Um, uh, as John said, at least if they were using, you know, the, the, the state licensed charter party carriers, they would be, uh, there would be a more level playing field here, but they're using people's private cars with faulty insurance, with no driver permitting, uh, with, with very lax uh, um, uh, inspections and so on and so forth. So that's the, the second myth is that uh, they can't lay claim to innovation. Their, their main innovation was 
uh, going into business by breaking the law and, and getting the uh, CPUC by whatever means to agree to allow it to continue to do that. And the other thing that I want to mention as a myth is there's this notion that these companies are, um, you know, using people who need a few extra bucks or they go out for a few hours a week in their private car and they pick up some money to, you know, supplement uh, their income. Maybe they're a student and they have a few bucks or, you know, somebody who's temporarily unemployed or underemployed. Uh, there are undoubtedly some people that fit into that category, but in general, it's, it's just not the case. This is big business. Uh, these companies that are doing it are multi-billion dollar companies. They are luring and enticing people into doing full-time work. Um, Uber has uh, programs where uh, you buy a car through them. Uh, they give you a, a, a cheaper interest rate. You, you pay off the vehicle through your, um, uh, through your uh, commissions to the company. Um, they give bonuses to people who, who work uh, over 50 or over 40 hours a week. They have a recent bonus program where they give you $5,000 as a bonus uh, to, to start working for them for more than 40 hours a week. Um, Lyft is, uh, has a service now with uh, uh, specially uh, equipped uh, SUV customized um, expensive vehicles. Uh, that their drivers are no doubt driving full time. It's the only way you make a profit on something like that. There's a company called Breeze that is actually leasing vehicles to drivers, even though the rules say they have to be people's personal uh, cars. Uh, so all of this is going on. Uh, it's going on under the CPUC knows They're not doing anything about it. And um, it's, it's taxi drivers, taxi industry that's taking it on the chin. And, uh, I know I've been speaking for a while, so I'll, I'll pass it on. Why don't we pass it on to Vina? Sure. So, if you'll forgive me, I'm going to read my notes, just because that's what we do in my discipline. Louder, uh, yeah, I will speak louder. So, um, Rhea, Rua introduced me briefly. I'm, um, I'm a PhD, and I um, do work on broadly on law work and, and social change, and also um, an attorney that worked briefly in the um, in the taxi industry um, at a nonprofit here in San Francisco. So I'm interested generally in questions of how laws and regulations shape work and how workers experience their work. Um, I want to reflect on my research on regulation and labor in San Francisco's, San Francisco's taxi industry and what light like, taxi history sheds on the potential pitfalls of what in California is no longer legally called ride-sharing companies, but transportation network companies. Public discourse on Uber, Lyft, and Sidecar has primarily focused on the risks and benefits to consumers, but I want to focus on the business model's impact on workers and the culture of work. It's well recognized that since the 1970s in the US and worldwide, social, economic, and political forces have aligned to make work more precarious. By precarious work, I mean employment that is uncertain, unpredictable, and risky from the point of view of the worker. Worker distress, obvious in a variety of forms, reminds us daily of such precarity. The Bureau of Labor Statistics estimates and likely underestimates that more than 30 million full-time workers lost their jobs involuntarily between the early 1980s and 2004. That is before the 2008 Great Recession. Job loss, of course, triggers many unpleasant events such as enhanced debt, mortgage foreclosures, decreased mental and physical well-being, etc. In the ride-sharing context, the TNCs exacerbate the conditions of worker precarity, both by contributing to a culture of part-time, legally unprotected work, and by essentially forcing the deregulation of the livery industry. My historical and empirical data underscores the real need for strong re-regulation in this industry. Let me share just a bit about the history of taxi driving in San Francisco. The first documented account of taxis in San Francisco was in 1906. By 1919, the San Francisco taxi industry consisted of about 500 drivers, the vast majority of whom were veterans of World War I. 
The Chauffeurs Union Local 265, under the leadership of business agent S.T. Dixon, represented all 500 of these drivers who engaged in frequent protests and strikes for better labor conditions. For those of you who know your history, you will note that the taxi industry was 100% unionized before the legalization of protected collective bargaining under the National Labor Relations Act of 1935. Through the work of the local, taxi workers went from working 16 to 20 hours a day with a split fee to a guaranteed wage of $4 per day and a 10-hour shift. Strangely and ironically, the TNCs, of course, put workers exactly back in this precarious early 20th century position. The city began first regulating the industry in 1909 because of lack of adequate insurance for drivers and passengers. Again, we see history repeating itself today. The city mandated commercial insurance and set the fare for, for, to prevent price, gou gou uh, price gouging, gauging, gouging, English as a second language. In 1929, during the throes of the Great Depression, the city went further and began regulating the number of taxis on the street to protect both the companies and drivers, ensuring both some degree of economic security. This was a trend all over the country. Taxi drivers in San Francisco enjoyed some degree of security and nobleness of profession under this regulation and under the rep representation of the chauffeurs union until the 1970s when taxi companies began experimenting with the practice of leasing. Today, many industries employ the principles of leasing and as a business practice, it embodies what economists and sociologists call the great risk shift. That is the systematic shifting of entrepreneurial risk onto the backs of workers. There's an entire business management literature on this phenomenon, and we see, of course, the burgeoning of freelance work in industries across the country. So how did this happen? Well, in the taxi industry, because of shifting administrative legal decisions and clever business lawyers, taxi cab companies realized that they could both avoid the entire uh, regime of employment benefits and rights and guarantee their own profit by making their workers independent contractors. So for those of you who don't know, in today's regime of employment and labor law, there are two categories of workers. There are employees and independent contractors. This is not a natural bifurcation, but one steeped in a fascinating history that I could talk about for a really long time, and one that determines who is protected under the law. Perversely, the workers who live the most precariously, who work part-time, who, who pay to work, like taxi workers, etc. These are the workers that are carved out of the law's protections who will not be considered employees under the law. So literally overnight, the companies changed the, the status of taxi workers on paper, reordering the workers' relationship to the company and depriving them of all of their rights as workers. What the culture of leasing has done to the taxi industries and to other industries is, among other things, to decimate worker security and safety net protections. It's had a hugely negative impact on how workers feel about their work, their pride of work, and their work-life balance. Now, these TNCs, Uber and Lyft, have taken things a step further, bringing livery workers in San Francisco to where they were in 1909. Until the advent of the ride-sharing services, what taxi drivers in San Francisco did have was at least some degree of economic security. They are regulated by the city and can go to their elected officials during drops in the economy, such as in 2008, and say, look, our grass prices are high, our ridership is down, we need a fare raise. And after careful research and considerations, these de democratically elected city officials would either grant or reject the request. They also have the certainty of knowing that aside from limos driving illegally around the city, the number of cabs at any given moment would be regulated to a certain number. This meant that full-time drivers would make at least some money. In my research, prior to the advent of these companies, that number was somewhere between $25,000 and $35,000, below one-third of the median household income of San Francisco. What the sharing economy has done in the context of the livery industry is made it really easy to get a ride, but at the cost of workers' lives. Neither TNC drivers nor cab drivers have safe or secure wages, and they continue to be carved out of employment laws and benefits because of the business models of the companies for which they work. I'll conclude by just saying that the work culture promulgated by the TNCs as they currently exist is not one that can help build middle class families or even lower middle class families. It is one that garners desperate poverty wages and promulgates precarious and anxious work lives. These companies make the rich richer and the poor poorer. My hope is not just to see stronger and better regulation of these industries, but also to see more responsible businesses and business models, ones that truly share the risks and responsibilities of work.
I'll also just say, and I didn't include it here, but I've written about it elsewhere, that there's um, a part of this discussion that's, that um, I think hasn't been had um, publicly as much as the debate over the regulations is that these companies are, um, are marketing and making profit off of um, racist and classist assumptions about the taxis, taxi industry. And there's a way in which they advertise both their drivers and their, uh, their ridership as being just like you, the middle class consumer. Um, and the, imp the implicit kind of, uh, the implicit sort of contrast that, you know, you, that the consumer gets in their mind is, oh, this person is, you know, might be a white woman or a middle class white man and not, you know, a smelly, hairy Indian taxi driver. Um, and I think that that, that I, I'm, I'm currently doing research into why it is that um, Uber and Lyft have, um, have been able to attract female drivers and, um, and why it is that they market so specifically for and to female drivers and to, um, in, their, in Lyft in particular, in their marketing, they um, show a lot of images of female drivers, female white drivers that are hip and sexy. And, um, and while well, females have not traditionally been a part of the taxi industry, and I think, um, I think one of the answers is that they are, are, um, are profiting off of a certain degree of, of, um, of anger and fear towards um, immigrant taxi men. And um, I think that there's an, there, are, there are very few times in, um, in the life of someone who works in downtown San Francisco in the financial district as a lawyer or as a, a corporate executive, there are very few times that that person will encounter um, an immigrant man or woman, and there's only one time that an immigrant man or woman is in charge of that person's body, and that's in a taxi. And I think that there's something inherently difficult and challenging about that, and they are, these companies are, um, are profiting off of the fears and the xenophobia and the racism that people, people have felt towards immigrant workers. And um, anyway, I thought it was worth mentioning. <laughs> questions was how has technology changed and I'll give you a real quick view of what it was when I started driving cab it was a 69 Plymouth with the four boards rotted out and I had a mechanical meter and there was no radio maybe an AM radio and uh, I got about eight miles to the gallon and the trip to the airport was about $12 and the gates were $27 so today in my, my Toyota Prius, I've got three, three cell phones, I've got a tablet, I've got a navigation system, um, and uh, I get about 40 miles to the gallon. And I've got tech around my neck, I've got tech all over me, and it's, uh, it's changed a lot. Um, I'm gonna talk about the failure of uh, the companies. I wasn't quite sure. I, I drive, uh, I've driven Uber Black, I've driven Uber X, I've driven, uh, and I use Uber Taxi in my cab. And right now, I gotta say, if I didn't have Uber Taxi in my cab, I wouldn't be making money. Um, uh, when I drove Uber, Uber Black a few years ago, or, uh, the amount of, it, it, when it was just Uber Black, I was making a, an amazing amount of somewhere between four to $700 a shift. On a Friday night, I could make almost $1,000. But now that they brought in UberX, those guys are, are struggling. Because um, it's not, it's, when Uber first came out, it was kind of fun and different. Sorry, know? what are these things, different kinds of Uber? Pardon? What is it, what are the different things? Where's Uber Black, UberX? Okay, Uber well, let me, uh, let me define that, or let me let you know. So Uber. Uber has, right now they have five, let's say, products or platforms. So when a, when a person opens up the Uber app, they have uh, five choices. Um, their, their first choice, or a choice on the far left, is an Uber taxi. And that's a ca taxi cab, okay? Just like you would a flywheel or hail one on the street. The next choice is an Uber X, which is a, a, a Prius or a small four-door sedan. 
Now they have an Uber XL, which will give you a minivan, a large, a large vehicle. Then they have Uber Black, which is a Lincoln or a luxury vehicle. And then the Uber SUV, which is an SUV. Um, now Uber has, you know, in their plan, uh, I don't know really what it is, but I, my guess is their plan is to, is to have everything funneled down into the Uber X. Um, they've, they've sold out the Uber Black, the, 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 the town car, which are run under a TCP, a state license. Um, their money, and I think the really gold mine is, is the Uber X, which is, uh, and I've driven Uber X. And I gotta tell you, when, I, when I've, I've driven maybe about 30 or 40 hours in an Uber X, and that thing is popping, constantly going on. Uh, those, the people who use that product are getting cars within three to five minutes. So it, it, you talk about competition, it's a really, it's, it's a very hard to compete. What, what the, the hole that the cab industry has buried us under is, is that, you know, for decades, you know, the person, you know, the passenger would call the cab company and say, when, and I've been a cab dispatcher, and I know what happens, you know, they call, you take the call and they say, uh, can I get a cab out to 43rd Avenue in Terrible? I say, yeah, I'll get right on it. I don't tell them the truth, I'll just tell them I'll get right on it. I don't say, sure, I can get you a cab. I hang up and I go, I doubt that I'll be able to get you a cab, you know, um, and that's the way it is. Uh, and so many times, um, so people, there was a, there's been a mistrust built up. The passengers call the cab company, they don't trust that the cab's going to come. The cab driver doesn't trust that the person's going to be there. So this has been going on for decades, and it's been getting worse and worse. Uh, and you have the, the, the large companies, especially Yellow and Luxor, uh, just saying, oh, it's not a problem. You know, even when Yellow put in their first computer system, you know, and, and the dispatch uh, numbers, this, were, you know, the, the service started, really started to go bad. You know? They just said, ah, don't worry about it. You know? And uh, uh, along with the corruption in, the, in the, uh, the taxi detail where they hired thousands of drivers that couldn't speak English. And, uh, and so these drivers, because they, they had such a, a, a limited way of uh, working their business, they, they, were, they started refusing rides. So downtown, they said, oh, I'm going out to the avenues. These drivers would refuse. So there's just been a, a built-in mistrust between the passenger and the, and the cab driver. You know? I can't tell you how many times when someone gets in my cab and they give me an address and they say, they start giving me directions and I say, no, you don't have to. I know where that is. Oh, you're the first driver in the last 10 years who's been going around that. And uh, so you, now you've got Uber. And, and the failure of Cagulus, the not flyable, was, was that they, um, they were almost, they were first to market, but they were too, a little too soon. You know, and, and their model wasn't, uh, it was a cumbersome model and it didn't, you know, it just didn't work as well. Um, yeah, there are a lot of apps out there, but the Uber app is a very good app. It's very simple. I think in tech terms, it's called Elegant. It's as simple as us pushing a button, and the driver just pushes a button, and and with that it transcends language. You know, a driver doesn't have to really know a whole lot to just yes or no, and to, and to take that that Uber call. So people are now finally getting the service that they want and deserve, and the companies have 100% failed to respond. The MTA couldn't respond, I guess, because of the regulations and. And uh, Hayashi was, was probably being, you know, her boss, uh, the mayor Lee, seemed to, he loved her for, I'm not sure why. I can only guess. So, um, uh, given the way that the companies have, have, have set this whole thing up to fail and, and their inability to respond, um, I, we're stuck with it. You know? um, Say my time is up. I got a question, uh, Keith. Yeah. Um, Bill Clark. Hi, Bill. Uh, now, under the Uber model, uh, is Uber X the only one that's uh, uh, using the personal insurance? Okay. The others have all commercial insurance. 
Uber no, no, no. Right. U- UberX, uh, well, actually, there are two UberX. There are UberXs that run under a TCP, and there are UberXs that are what they call community cards. Most of them are community cards. Actually, one is personal cards. Personal car, yeah. Now, an UberX that has a TCP is run as a, a commercial carrier and is re- regulated by the state and is, is owned by a company, and you know, they're, they're legal. Can you just add something to that? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, UberX is the uh, non-luxury sedan platform of the Uber app, and they don't require a TCP license. Right. But some drivers, and I, I know a driver who did this, um, he was a former cab driver and he wanted to do UberX, but he just personally for himself chose to apply uh, with the state for a state-issued TCP license and put it on his Prius. And he, he paid the extra money for a commercial livery insurance because he wanted to make sure that he was licensed and insured. Uh, but that's not a requirement on the UberX platform. So what a lot of people do is they just use their personal insurance. I was actually going to do it. I was going to do UberX. And um, I, I took advantage of Uber's uh, car financing program. And so I got approved for a car at a Toyota dealership and I was gonna buy a Prius, uh, but I called my insurance company and I told them I wanna buy a Prius and I wanna do Uber X and uh, they have commercial insurance so if you just give me the personal insurance side of that and they said no that they would not because it violates their personal insurance policy. So they said also that neither is any other reputable, credible insurance company gonna do that for you. And so what is happening at a large scale is, is the, the way these, the UberX platform and Lyft and Sidecar, the way they're able to operate is simply by relying on all these drivers doing this, but not telling their insurance companies about it. So there's no real transparent, legitimate way that they can run a sole proprietorship transportation service. And so I had a choice of just BSing my insurance company and saying, oh, I'm just buying a personal car, and then just don't tell them that I'm using it as a, a livery vehicle. But I guess I've just been in the taxi business too long to try to run a business that way. So, so some people actually uh, get TCP licenses because they don't want to do it that way. Either. Has there been any insurance company that, was, that has come forward and said, yeah, we're going to cover this? Not, not to date, to my knowledge. They've all, they've all, they've all the insurance company on their side. Why aren't they here? Why aren't we coordinating? Well, they're, they're the state legislature. They're actually the insurance company, the insurance industry in California, the, the federations and associations that represent the big, you know, Liberty Mutual, State Farm, AAA, Geico, and all these companies are actually uh, sponsoring a bill, AB 2293. A lot of the cab industries oppose that bill for other reasons because they just, you know, but. Uh, the insurance industry is behind this bill to require that these Uber X cars carry the same uh, million dollar uh, insurance policies at least while the app is on. And Will insurance companies cover these people? Or just no, they, they, so State Farm is my insurance company and they're, they're underwritten to provide personal car insurance, home insurance, life insurance, and everything like that. They can provide some kinds of business insurance on your car. So like if I was delivering, if I was running a courier service where I delivered packages, I could upgrade my insurance policy to cover that. But when you transport human beings for hire, that's a far greater liability than a package or a pizza or some flowers or whatever. Human life is, is, is a far higher liability, so the insurance to cover that is, is much higher. It's a very special area of insurance called livery insurance or tax How insurance. Huh? How much higher is it? Mark, you know better than that. Uh, taxis typically pay uh, anywhere between $8,500 uh, to maybe over $10,000 a year per vehicle for insurance. So compare that to, you know, well, a lot of personal liability insurance is under $1,000 a year. And that price difference, Uber doesn't have to pay what he, the, the kind of prices on per vehicle that he just said. And because they've got all this venture capital and practically zero overhead costs on these cars, 
they can undercut us, and that's what they're doing. They just drop their prices yet again, whereas if, if they had to pay for the insurance, that kind of insurance on those vehicles, like AB 2293 is kind of pushing for that direction, they would not be able to afford to undercut our prices like they're doing now. They'd have to raise their prices something comparable to what we pay, and then we can handle the competition because everybody's playing on the level platform. And I should just say, just since this labor fest, that that doesn't just affect the taxi workers, but it also affects the Uber drivers who have no stable income. They can't predict how much they're going to make. They can't predict when Uber is going to drop prices. Price dropping doesn't just affect how much money Uber makes. It affects dramatically affects how much money drivers make. So in San Francisco, there was a few months ago, a few weeks ago, um, massive Uber protest uh, by Uber drivers in front of um, Uber headquarters where drivers were saying, um, stop exploiting us. Um, and the irony, of course, is that they're, ask they're, ask they're asking to be put in a position that would really make them a taxi driver. Um, can I just weigh in on the yeah. insurance mm -hmm. uh, part of it? Because um, as uh, Vina was talking before about the um, precarity, precarious, or you used the word precarity, so I'll use precarity, of the situation of, of the drivers in these instances. And insurance is you know, a perfect example of this. Because um, under current conditions and even under uh, the new approaches that the state legislature is looking at and the CPUC is looking at, there are still going to be gaps in insurance where there will be zero insurance in, in certain instances. Uh, it's a little complicated to explain, so I won't go into it. Uh, there are other instances under uh, some of these new approaches where there's going to be gross underinsurance. And of course, that is a terrible thing for the, uh, for the public, uh, for somebody who gets injured uh, in an accident. But it's also a terrible thing for the driver of this vehicle because who is ultimately responsible? If you're negligent in an accident and your insurance doesn't cover it, it falls upon you personally. You, you're going to lose your car. You, if you have a house, you, you could lose that. You could lose every penny you have in the bank and you know, forget it. So um, th this is another instance of uh, the, the um, the risk being placed directly on the person at the lowest level in this whole chain, the worker is taking the risk. I saw a, a hand up here, and then Tara, and then back to you, and then Steve. I wanted to come on, you know, the little card that I see with the mustache, the pink mustache. Someone told me that you can kind of make a deal with the driver for the price. Well, let, let, let me say that if somebody uh, calls for that vehicle uh, by using the app, then they're going to be charged uh, according to whatever the pricing of the app is. Uh, it, 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 it could be, uh, in some instances, less than a taxi. In some instances, it's going to be more than a taxi because they do something called surge pricing, which is a whole other area to discuss. But we also know that many of these drivers uh, are picking people up in the street even though it's illegal. Um, you know, this has been going on for years with the limousines and uh, now it's, it's spreading out. And uh, also, th there's no question that uh, some of these drivers are developing private clientele where they don't do it through the app. And in that case, um, you know, the, the, the driver charges whatever the, uh, the traffic is. And do the companies pay for that? Well, no, from the company's standpoint, uh, this is all, uh, you, know, uh, you know, not legal. So they, they, they want the drivers to use the app, but, um, you know, uh, some people are going to see a, an opportunity to make some money, not have to pay a commission, uh, be able to develop their own, you know, sideline, and uh, they're going to do it. Well, I mean, for well over a decade, we've been talking and trying to uh, promote a central dispatch system. So, but um, the, the large companies that are fighting it, they say that their dispatchers, they have a proprietary ownership of their dispatch and they don't want to share it with anybody else at the cost of service. So, um, it, it 
If I had it my way, I'd, I'd say the city should come out with a city branded app. Um, Flywheel is close, but Flywheel is just another for profit entity. Their, their brand is not a strong brand at all. It's a terrible brand, as far as I'm concerned. The, the city should have a city. It should be a city branded app. This is a San Francisco taxi app. You know, that brand should be on every single San Francisco taxi cab, and that anybody at any time could get a San Francisco taxi cab with the push of a button. And, and that, that is true competition. That would put most of these TNCs, it would hit them really hard. Because a lot of people don't want to ride in TNCs because they're not cabs. You know, they do it because they provide the service. So if the cab industry provided the service, that's the best thing that, that, could, that could happen. But you've got the mayor on one side, you have the cab companies on the other side, and it's like um, kind of pathetic. There are a lot of problems in the taxi industry that need fixing and you could probably use a good shot in the arm with some good competition. The problem with the TNCs is that it's kind of like the, the new boss is the same as the old boss. And in fact, the new boss might be even a little bit worse than the old boss because they're basically patterning their business model on a decades long model of the taxi industry, which I don't know how many people understand this. If you're new, you may kind of wake up to this. The taxi companies say, we don't provide taxi service. We just rent our cars out. All we are is basically what they're saying is we're just a car rental service. So we don't actually deal with passengers. The cab drivers do that. And they rent us our cars. The cab drivers are our number one customer. And the passengers, they're just kind of like secondary customers but we make our money off the drivers. And that's what these new apps are doing. They're saying, we're not transportation companies, we're just apps. And they're basically putting all the liability, at least the TNCs, they're putting all the liability on the drivers. So, except the taxi companies provide insurance. That's what I'm saying is that the new bosses are a little bit, might even be a little bit worse than the old boss because somebody was asking about workers' comp, at least if you get, if you're a driver, and you're injured in an accident while you're on the job. In a taxi. Yeah, in a taxi cab, at least by law, you have workers' comp. And the only way that TNC drivers are gonna get workers' comp, most likely the way I understand the law, you know, people like Mark and, you know, we kind of, right, we've talked about this a lot over, over the years. Somebody in the TNC business is gonna have to get injured. And they're gonna have to get injured real bad and they're gonna say, well, you know, I mean, what do I do, the, you know, Uber, Lyft, whatever, they, they should be helping me out here and the companies are gonna deny them. And it's gonna to have to probably go to uh, Superior Court of California where they're gonna to have to argue that I'm not really a, a proprietor, I'm not really a business owner, I'm actually an employee of this company. So I have to be protected by workers' comp law. And they're gonna to have to take that to court and it, it's probably going to be something like that. It, with the tax industry, it went to the district court, Ninth Circuit, and it's probably going to be the same thing. People in the audience have noticed too that taxi workers got workers' compensation and unemployment insurance in 1996 in a case, Tracy v. Yellow Cab. Um, but in my research, what I found that is now this many years later, taxi workers, although they do have those things on the books, um, or at least workers' compensation on the books, have been really afraid to, to apply for workers' compensation for fear of being blacklisted in the industry. And for me, what that speaks to is the fact that if you, even if you have all of these employment, these like rights here and there, unemployment insurance, workers' compensation, it's meaningless <coughs> if on the ground, the workers and the bosses don't, have, don't share equal power. And I think that um, both in, in the in the ride sharing industries and in the taxi industries, even though under the National Labor Relations Act, sorry, under the National Labor Relations Act, taxi drivers are likely not going to be considered employees and therefore are likely not going to be protected under, um, under our US laws and risk antitrust um, liability by, for organizing. There's just not going to be worker protection, even if a district court says, okay, Uber drivers are employees. Um, there's not gonna be real worker protection until there's worker power. Um, and that's not gonna be granted by a court that's going to be built in the streets. Let me go along with what Vino was saying. 
Uh, one uh, taxi company manager told me a few years back that over a certain period of time, he paid out about a million dollars in workers' compensation um, uh, premiums, and he and out of that, about fifty thousand dollars was paid uh, to uh, work worker claims. So there really is a tremendous amount of um, fear and intimidation, and um, just plain. Um, you know, ignorance on the part of drivers about their... Just say, th there was a moment um, back around 2011, uh, this was after um, Uber had gone into operation, but they were not yet using uh, people's private vehicles, they were using state license vehicles. It was, it was Lyft and Sidecar that threw that extra wrinkle into it. Uh, around 2011, uh, the, uh, the people who uh, were running uh, at that time Cabulous, a later flywheel. By the way, I have to take some issue with what Keith was saying about um, Cabulous and flywheel. It did start off as, um, you know, a, uh, a startup uh, technology that um, had a ways to go, but they have improved the thing uh, constantly, and uh, I think it's a very good system now, and um, I, I, I think it's a good competitor against Lyft and Sidecar and so forth. But back around 2011, um, they approached the city and they said, um, we want to have uh, an app that's available to all cabs. And uh, the MTA started working on a system called Open Taxi Access, which would have uh, spread you know, either um, the, the Cabulous app or something similar uh, to all the cabs in the city. And, the big cab companies, which were, um, you know, I think being extremely short-sighted about it, um, <coughs> basically killed it. Uh, and, and it was only after that that companies like uh, Lyft and, and Sidecar uh, came into the uh, picture. And then Uber actually followed them in using uh, private uh, vehicles. And, and by the way, uh, when I say private vehicles, that's another misnomer. These things are commercial vehicles. It's just that the state refuses to, to, to make them register as commercial vehicles. Uh, they're going around, they're, they're, they're doing livery service like everybody else. It's a commercial vehicle, but they don't have to call themselves that. They don't need the place. So I think the TLPA, Taxi Limousine Paratransit Association, has filed a couple of appeals in courts saying that these are taxi cabs, not uh, livery services or whatnot. So uh, th I guess that's one angle. Um, again, I kind of differ as far as strategy with some of the other people in the tax industry. I think AB 2293 is just fine. It, uh, basically what I support is the Department of Insurance recommendations for these TNCs, which means that they have to provide a million dollars of insurance coverage on, on these vehicles whenever the app is open. And the fact that Uber, Lyft are so against this means that it's probably at least adequate, in, in my opinion. I, I, I don't really care if there's competition out there. I, I feel like I'm a good enough cab driver to compete, but I feel like, uh, just like everybody else in the taxi industry, the competition has to be fair and I think that that law makes it fair. And that law makes it so that they can't undercut us, so that their, their operation costs are gonna be something similar to what taxis have to pay, and therefore their prices are gonna be have to, something similar to what taxi cabs are. And that's really the only edge that they got on us. And, and as long as that's level, I, I think cabs are gonna survive just fine. You know, and obviously, uh, you know, talking about it from the point of view of, of uh, transportation and taxis and TNCs, but this is a, a, actually a much larger social phenomenon that's going on right now. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'd just like to ask her where she sees this going um, in terms of workers, in terms of society, and is there any uh, hope or possibility or opportunity to turn a corner on this, or is it just uh, going to keep going in that same direction? Okay, so that's a big question. Um, I would yes. speak up. So I would, I, just to um, underscore what Mark is saying in terms of how this is really a direction and um, 
Steve, is that Steve, Steve also mentioned you know, the concept of independent contractor. So there is, um, I think there's a projection that over the next, um, the ne uh, next 10, 20 years, over 40% of our workers in the US will be considered independent contractors or freelancers. And, um, and there's this whole kind of rhetoric that you hear a lot about in the tech industry where workers want flexible work, workers want um, freelance work, workers don't want to be in an office, they want to be able to play beer pong while they're programming or whatever. Um, and so that we are somehow fulfilling the desires of a workforce. Um, and, and then the flip side of that is that US labor laws, um, which were actually written to protect all workers, but were undermined in 1948 with the passage of the Labor Management Relations Act, um, when you started to see carve outs for workers, I shouldn't say all workers, so agricultural workers were always carved out of the National Labor Relations Act, railroad workers were all always carved out, and household workers were always carved out. But in 1948 was when we first saw um, the term independent contractor, um, you, which was normally just a term used in the tort context for vicarious liability, all of a sudden implemented into the employment and labor context such that workers all of a sudden who were considered independent contractors, who were quote unquote entrepreneurs, um, were carved out if we're not able to gain access to labor laws, we're not able to unionize, we're not able to get access to workers' compensation, um, all of those things. So um, I think in more recent years with um, the, edif the, uh, the edification of the, the businessman, the edification of um, neoliberal notions of freedom, the entrepreneur has become the quintessential actor. So we, so we see this kind of looking, instead of looking at freelance work as unprotected work, um, there's a romanticization of these are all micro entrepreneurs who are, um, who are you know, free, free of what, I'm not sure, but they're free. And, um, and, so, and so this is, and this is something, it's, it's, very, it's very seductive and it's very, um, you know. And it's the internet story too. Right. The too. Right. So, it's, I mean, it's easily critiqued, but it's also very seductive and, um, and maybe there's something to it. But in terms of hope, you know, I thought, because I'm a legal scholar, um, I think a lot about, well, what are ways mm. to remedy um, remedy the situation, and there's been a lot of discussion in both um, on the continent, in Europe, and in the U.S. and in Canada about how to redraw the employee boundaries so that employees are um, are, are are then considered um, all workers are then considered employees under the laws and get kind of the benefits intended under New Deal legislation. I don't know that that's politically possible. Um, something that I've been thinking a lot about, which seems utopian, but actually has has um, played out in context, some different contexts internationally. It was ironically considered under the Nixon administration was the notion of basic income. So instead of all of our sort of resources and thoughts and um, ideas going towards making sure that workers have benefits, um, making sure instead of, instead of putting money into a welfare state, having a state where everyone is granted basic income. So everyone has the income to live, and therefore they can choose whether or not to work, and whether or not to, um, and, and how to work, and what kind of lifestyle that they can or would live. And it sounds, you know, it sounds totally utopian, but it's been, it, there are different, there's sociologists and political theorists and economists who are thinking about ways in which to make this work, and it's actually one of my next projects um, to think about, as opposed to constantly trying to redraw the employee line and fighting businesses along the way, to help rethink, to reorient the state towards its citizen, so that um, so that it's not the citizen that helps that helps the state to to stand up on its two feet, but it's the citizen that it's the state that helps the citizen um, to reorient ourselves in terms of how we think of our society conceptually. You could think of one. Okay, <laughs> Vina. Well, I'd love to hear from all of you just maybe a story or an anecdote of of what you've heard people have to do to survive, um, just to give us all a sense of how precarious and difficult this work is and how you have to constantly entrepreneurialize yourself to, to make money, um, to, to just make a living because of this, these situations. Can we start with Keith then? <laughs> well, let's see, two, two iPhones, an Android, and a, and a tablet, and uh, you know, I mean, I, I, I'm surrounded by all this stuff, you know, and uh, it's... Oh, that is distracting, guys. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I'm 
pretty much a lab rat. I mean, I, I do, I mean, you, you just, I, it's by intuition at this point, you know, um, just pure experience. And uh, uh, so I think I, to really make money nowadays without an app, I, I don't know if it's really possible. Um, uh, every driver has kind of like their own scheme for doing things. So mine is to keep moving. Uh, and uh, they keep turning rocks over. So, and I drive in the daytime, and it's, it's pretty hard. You know, and, uh, uh, so I think without the apps, it would be a real challenge. So, so, I, so I, I, used, I was actually in the first group of cab drivers when Uber opened up its taxi platform. I was in the very first group of cab drivers in their orientation. And so I used Uber Taxi for a while. And at first, you know, it was like this new thing, it was, it was all right, but eventually I, I couldn't stand it. Cause, um, you know, and that was okay. I got a 4.8 rating, you know, that's what I maintained. I just couldn't stand the people. Um, it, it, it started getting really unfun to drive a cab because I don't know what it is about Uber, uh, but you couldn't talk about anything except you have to be conversational, except everything you say has to be really positive. And you know, <laughs> you know I'm, I'm a positive person, but like you, you couldn't talk about Malaysian Airlines crashing, you couldn't talk about Gaza, because you know, when you, when you get cab passengers, you get all kinds of people. Some people love to talk about this stuff, but with Uber, you gotta talk about, it's just another wonderful day. <laughs> I couldn't be myself, and and uh, there was just no diversity in, in, in amongst the Uber, and I couldn't stand it when they call, talk, they get in the cab and they address me by name because it shows up on their phone, and like they've known me for the last twenty years, and it's like, come on, man, you don't know me. It's like. I, I could be friendly, I could, but anyway, so I, I uh, after Uber, the, the New Year's Eve accident where the little girl got hit and killed by the Uber X driver and Uber said they were not gonna take responsibility for that, that, that really turned me off. And um, then they said they're gonna start charging $10 a week uh, in addition to the 10% they're taking out of my fares. And you know, I was getting good business off of it. It still would have been from a financial point of view worth it, but I just decided that overall, I'd prefer to make a little less and enjoy what I'm doing. So I, I, I gave them back their phone and I got Flywheel. You know, I understand Fly, you know, Cabulous probably had a lot of problems, but I, I think it's a great yeah. app. Yeah. And, and, and every passenger that, uh, that, I, that gets in using it say they really love it. And it's turned their, their 45 minute wait into a five minute wait for a cab. And the only problem I have with Flywheel is they don't do any marketing like Uber and Lyft. They, they need to really market themselves. And that, that's it. That's, uh, but you know, ever since Uber cut their prices big time for Uber X, I, I, I gotta consider, maybe I gotta drive for one of these things, you know? Uh, and I don't wanna do that, because if the cab business goes down, they're gonna be the only games in town. And they got all that price surging and prime time tipping and everything like that. Once the cabs are gone, they've got the passengers. And that's it. So. Can you talk to a person at Uber anymore? When I was with them, you could only email them. Yeah, you could only email them, right? At least with Flywheel, you can call somebody and they'll call you back and you can talk straight with somebody if you got an issue. Or Jones would step forward, but we happen to know where Dave Jones is on this because. He uh, held an investigative hearing uh, on this precise subject uh, in Sacramento. Uh, a representative of Gaston's office was there and said, we have evidence and we have prosecuted uh, cases of insurance fraud by uh, rides, not by these companies, but by the drivers. They're going after the drivers, okay? So, you know, we, we and he presented this in evidence uh, at, at Dave Jones's hearing, and Dave Jones was perfectly aware of it, came out with a white paper on this stuff, and he's basically whitewashing 
uh, the thing away. He's saying, you know, yeah, you need a little more insurance, but even if it's not, you know, really good enough, you know, we, we can maybe tell people that your insurance isn't so hot and, uh, you know, let them fend for themselves. That's basically his position on this. So, uh, unfortunately, what, what she's holding in her hand is uh, a resolution that Eric Marr uh, presented at a committee of the Board of Supervisors um, that uh, would have gotten the city involved uh, in uh, serious enforcement and serious um, examination of, of what legal steps could be taken uh, to, to rein in uh, the illegalities uh, that are going on. And uh, Scott Wiener uh, managed to get the thing amended uh, in committee to uh, turn it completely inside out so that now it's uh, a resolution that's saying how wonderful the ride services are and that they, they should be part of the city's transportation system, part of the city organization. There, there is, uh, the, three, the three that exist right now are United Taxi Cab Workers, which has been around for more than 25 years, uh, the San Francisco Cab Drivers Association, which is now a few years old and um, was basically started over uh, some differences between United Taxi Cab Workers and their group over the sale of taxi medallions. We were opposed to the sale of taxi medallions. They were willing to accept the sale of taxi medallions under certain, um, with certain qualifications. But, um, you know, we have a larger issue now. These two groups, I think, should and could and should come together. The third group is the Medallion Holders Association. And uh, they basically look after medallion holder um, interests. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I, you know, even though those interests uh, do more closely coincide with the interests of all drivers, uh, I think that there's still a certain gulf or a gap between what the medallion holders want, which is, you know, basically a self-protective organization, as, as any you know um, group of people should be, but uh, I, they uh, what they want is frequently at odds with what ordinary drivers who do not have taxi medallions uh, want. And if if anybody is unaware of the distinction, uh, if you have a taxi medallion, that gives you the right to put a taxi on the street. Uh, there is a lease value to that medallion. Uh, it brings with it a greater income, greater job flexibility, and a, and a number of other perks. And so there really is this divide in the industry between those who have medallions and those who don't. And I say this as somebody who has a medallion myself, but um, there, there are definite uh, differences between the two. But uh, uh, you, you know, to unite uh, drivers, or as many as possible, under one banner, I think would be terrific. We are in frequent touch with the New York Taxi Workers Alliance, which is now the National Taxi Workers Alliance. A um, uh, representative of that group was out here maybe a month ago, uh, and we had some conversations, and that's an ongoing uh, discussion. There's also the Taxi Limousine Paratransit Association, which is more company membership, right? Yeah, but they're the ones, they're an international association of taxi limousine paratransit vehicles. And they're the ones who are filing the appeal in court challenging the decision that uh, Lyft and Sidecar and UberX are charter party carriers and not taxis. So, so they're filing an appeal on the grounds that they believe these are taxi cabs. And if the courts actually find them to be taxi cabs, then they would follow, they would fall under the local jurisdiction and San Francisco could regulate them. Then for like three days I was trying to get this, my app fixed and then um, the person uh, on the other side, he disappeared. <laughs> and like two hours later I said, what the hell? He just walked off, you know? And that's the way that they are. When you deal in this impersonal way by email, that person said it's six o'clock. I go, and, and like, I'm out there working, and, and the app is off, and it wasn't, and so I sent out a real nasty email. And I did that because if I don't exist, then they don't exist, right? And I'll just say whatever the fuck I want to say to them. And I did. And I got this real, real nice thing the next day saying, try it again. 
But it was just like, I really got at that point that uh, they're up on the third floor behind a locked door and they do not want to talk to me. You know? And from a labor point of view, I just feel like you know, I don't exist. They don't want me to exist. I, I'm just a bit, you know, I'm just a little bit on their screen. And, and that way they can, that's how they can insulate themselves from like the, the death of that little girl. To shield themselves from all these issues that we're talking about, or uh, really in a different kind of relationship with them, and um, it, it brings to mind uh, something I have here on my phone, which I'm going to read to you, which is a a message that uh, a driver, who a cab driver who uses Uber Taxi, uh, got from from Uber, and um, this kind of came out of the blue, uh, and it says. Uh, hi, so-and-so. Please refrain from expressing political or personal opinions on Uber rides. Many riders find this intrusive. Thanks. So here's a company that claims that the people that are working under it are totally independent businessmen that, you know, are just their partner. We were up there, you are my partner. And what they're doing and saying is they're trying to actually control the person's political speech. You know, I mean, delving into the, you know, the sort of the most uh, sensitive, you know, most serious, you know, issue of control that you could possibly have over a person, over over their, their speech and their thought and their their expression of of, of opinion. And so, I, you know, I think that there might be very good grounds for. Um, and, and at least one lawsuit has been started, I believe, in Boston on, on this issue of whether their drivers are actually employees. And it's quite possible that, you know, if more stuff like this comes out, that, that a court could find that, that these people are really employees of these companies. On the driver, there's no company, once again, uh, we're not involved in this. Um, I, I just talked to a friend in Seattle where the city has now instituted a 10 cent surcharge on all of the Uber rides that will go into a fund for ramp limousine <coughs> rides, um, vehicles. But San Francisco doesn't have anything like that yet, not even close. Um, do any of you have any comments on accessible vehicles? No. Well, the, the, the CDUC passed their rules and regulations that require that they have to have a, a certain degree of accessible vehicles. So if they're in the mayor's office saying that they just wish somebody would come out driving for them with an accessible vehicle, uh, it's, actually, it's actually the law that they have to have. And so they don't, they don't seem to be representing it. They're not in the business. They just got a phone Right. But that's that's contradictory to what the, the CPUC decision reads. And so they're still out there uh, putting out mis misinformation about who they are and what they are. Uh, I think the short answer is that it's a lawsuit waiting to happen. Uh, and uh, the, the other part of it is that the, the app itself uh, first of all, you have to have a smartphone to use it. Um, you have to have a credit card to use it. And so if you're a disabled person who does not have either of those things, you can't use their service, and that may also be a, a violation of the Americans with disabilities. Or a person, a person doesn't have money. Now, maybe the disabled need to block the office of Uber. Well, that, that'll get, uh, you know, if Uber's office in San Francisco gets blocked, by people who should be getting service from, from Uber or not. Well, Flywheel has all the technology to answer your question. Um, it, 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 it could all be programmed into the Flywheel. Flywheel doesn't have to 
use the credit card app they didn't originally. That's actually in each one. So, a flywheel could cover that issue. 